chapter 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Amen. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein. For the time is at hand. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace, from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, and to him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, Amen. and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom of patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in spirit, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Yep and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches that are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, unto Sardis, unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid, at, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. That's good. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sowest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the, se are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sowest are the seven churches. Amen. Amen. Father, thank God. Pray God to be us. Lord, help us, strengthen us, show us thy word. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, hearing that, just, just hearing that word come forth, hearing the scriptures read out loud, it just encourages me. I mean, I'm just I'm just full now of the Spirit. That's awesome. That is so good. The the reading of the Word of God. And this same Bible passage gives us a promise that he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein are blessed by it. The blessing and encouragement of God comes by means of the very word of God. We need to, as Christians, embrace the word of God, absorb the word of God, hold on to the word of God. What else do we have to stand on? I'm going to continue on in our study of Revelation, beginning there at verse 7, where the Bible reads, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so, 
Amen. And I love how it sanders it there. An amen and an amen between that statement of Christ returning, coming in clouds. And it has to be so. If the clouds are going to be rolled back as a scroll, when he returns, there must have been clouds there to begin with. Are we wrong to sing on the bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise? When the roll is called up yonder, I think we are. And that's why when I hear that hymn, I always sing it on that bright and cloudy morning. And the dead in Christ shall rise. His first coming, I'm not sure if anyone's aware, and I was interested when I first discovered this, was the same as his second, and that's in clouds. Keep your finger, as always, in Revelation chapter 1. Turn to Job 38, if you will, Job 38. In Job 38, you're going to find this statement, and if you want, you can even go, if you can't get there fast enough, to Luke chapter 2. In Job 38, you're going to find this. The Bible records in verse 6, Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who shut up the sea with doors, when it breaketh forth as if it had issued out of the womb? When I made the cloud the garment thereof, and thick darkness a swaddling band for it. Here God, when he steps out in front of Job, finally speaks and answers out of the whirlwind. And he says, first, who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up thy loins now like a man, for I will demand of thee an answer thou may. And he begins to ask him very pointed questions, one after another, after another, after another, all meant to show of his wondrous works, all meant to bring glory unto himself. And he asks the question, where wast thou when the foundations were fastened? Who laid the cornerstone thereof? Jesus Christ is the foundation. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. And here in illusion, he brings that. The sons of God shouting for joy when he arrived. His angels are heard from on high singing and rejoicing as Christ the Savior is born. In a parable here, in a light picture, he asked, when I made the cloud, the garment thereof, and the thick darkness, a swaddling band for it, the cloud being that very swaddling band. In Luke chapter 2, that cloud being the swaddling band gets highlighted when it talks about Christ Jesus coming to this earth. Luke chapter 2 and verse 12. Luke chapter 2 and verse 12. He says, And this shall be a sign unto you, ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, laying in a manger. So typify Christ came in clouds the first time, and by express concern of the scriptures and express expression of the very scriptures, he comes a second time in clouds. Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. And in verse 36, Luke 24 and verse 36. The Bible says, And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and afraid, and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled, and why do thoughts arise in your heart? Behold my hands and my feet, and that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me to have. Jesus revealing what his resurrected soul or his resurrected body is made up, and that's flesh and bones, not like a spirit. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And it continues, and while they were yet believed not, while they yet believed not for joy, and wandered, he said unto them, Have ye any meat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and an honeycomb, and he took it and did eat it before him. Again, showing that his resurrected body can take and can absorb food, broiled fish, and a honeycomb, and can have that and keep that and use that. In verse 49 it says this, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. And he he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. And this thought continues in Acts chapter 1. It continues in Acts chapter 1, verse 4, where the Bible says, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me. 
For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. In verse 8 it says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, the promise you're given, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Algeria and in Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the world. In verse 9, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, the one that they had seen resurrected, this same Jesus, which is presently taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go up into heaven. His first coming was in the swaddling band and in the manger as his mom embraced him. That swaddling band pictured by the cloud in Job chapter 38. And then the second coming, he returns from the dead, resurrected, shows himself openly unto many brethren where they touch. They embrace him. They feast with him. They eat with him. He encourages them. He strengthens them. He says, wait for the promise and that he is lifted up and in the same way that he had arrived, in the same way that he goes up, he returns to the cloud, the same cloud that he will return into. In that same fashion, verse 9 says, that cloud will receive him, so shall he come in that same manner. So again, I love to sing the great hymn when the roll is called up yonder, but I'm always careful to say on that bright and cloudy morning because this is a distinguishing factor of the return of Christ. It will be cloudy. There will be a cloud as it received him that will open up and send him back. He will roll back the clouds and behold, amen and amen, he cometh with clouds. Yes, he cometh with clouds. And it says in Revelation, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. They also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. Even so, amen. So while this is not something that I'm going to go and argue and bicker about everybody, I'm going to keep that in my heart. I'm going to receive the blessing that God is promising here to grab a hold of the idea of clouds, because who knows? Maybe the Antichrist shows up and he's on a clear crystal sky morning and that is one of the signs of the times that will reveal to us the truth and we just grabbed hold of that scripture it's been revealed unto us as this very book has promised to do it has signified of something it has made it clear unto us and we can grab a hold of the fact that God is returning in clouds God will come back he cometh yes he cometh with clouds and every eye the Bible says shall see him and so here he's coming Every eye is seeing him. The coming, the gathering, also known as the rapture, is not going to be some secret, obscure thing. It is going to be seen and witnessed by many. The Bible here says that they shall see him. Every eye shall see him. All kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Every and all. We're not Calvinists in here. Do we believe when it says every and it says all that it means exactly that? Every eye shall see him. All kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Let it be. So be it. Glory to God. We are going to see him. Every eye shall see him if we're alive and we remain unto this day. The Bible describes this, though, as a day of mourning. We see all kindreds wailing. All kindreds mourning. We'll get more into what that means. But to us, Jesus Christ coming is a great celebration. So why is it a great mourning here? Well, because they also which pierced him are going to bear witness of this thing. Keep your finger there, John chapter 19. There, John chapter 19 and verse 28. John chapter 19 and verse 28. John 19, 28. After this, Jesus knowing that all things, there it is again, all things were now accomplished that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, and put it into his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, remember he just said the scriptures were fulfilled, he said, and he makes the plain statement, it is finished, and he bowed his head, and gave up the ghost. Here Christ cries out from the cross, his final words, it is finished. What was finished? 
Go to the same book of John in verse chapter 4 and verse 34. His work was finished. In 5 and verse 36, his works were finished. In chapter 17 and verse 4, his work was finished. It was the work, the work, the work. The work that you and I can't do. The good works that you and I can't do. The Amen. perfect, sinless Son of God committed himself and completed the works that were set before him. And this is why when he hung on that cross, recognizing the scriptures being fulfilled, the whole of the law being fulfilled, cried out, it is finished. There bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The work, the work, the work, the work. It's done. It's finished. Everything needed for Christ to provide what we needed, right? Because our sins separate us from heaven. Our sins have been ever a wickedness and an affront to God. And our sins are bringing contempt upon us, wrath upon us from the Almighty God. He finished that so that He could be the sinless one and said, It is finished. I have accomplished, Father, the works that you have sent me to do. Verse 31, he's going to continue. The Bible says, The Jews, therefore, the Jews, therefore, remember we're talking about the piercing of Christ. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day, besought Pilate that they that their legs might be broken, referring to Christ and the two thieves, and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and brake the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. And it begins as Satan winds up and he gets ready to break the scriptures that needed to be fulfilled. Everything that was in the power of Christ was finished, but something more was needed to be accomplished. What were the scriptures that needed to be accomplished? Well, it's, we're going to continue. We're going to read. But, verse 33, when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers, which with a spear pierced in his side... One of the soldiers with his spear pierced his side, and forthwith there came out blood and water. And he that saw it bear witness, he that saw it bear record, and his record is true. And he knoweth that he saith is true, that ye might believe. Verse 36, for these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. Exodus 12, Numbers 9, 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, fulfillment of these. And again another scripture saith, they shall look upon him whom they have pierced. So here this is referred to in Revelation. It's also in Zechariah in chapter 12. You can go to Zechariah chapter 12 if you will. Here he's talking about, and Zechariah is right near Matthew, just in front of it. Zechariah chapter 12. Here we see the Jews besought Pilate that he would break the legs. And that would have broken the fulfillment of the prophecy here in Zechariah that promised that not a bone would be broken. Here the soldier began to carry it out in verse 34, and he instead recognized that Jesus was already dead and put the piercing of the blade into his side. John then, in verse 35, saw it and the scriptures were fulfilled. If you're turning to Zechariah chapter 3, they also, every eye, all kindred, is what's being drawn upon from the New Testament book of Revelation. What that's referring to, and what I believe is they also which pierced him. Some people will say, oh, that's the Jews. Well, but the Jews just besought that the Romans would do it. The Romans went and they were going to break the legs and break the prophecy, but instead they recognized he was dead and put a thrust into his side and pierced his side and fulfilled that. But it was the Jews that encouraged it and called upon it. Then John also saw witness, bear witness, and affirmed that that was the truth that everybody who beholds and reads might believe. Who I believe is referring to, they also which pierced him, just encapsulates and brings together the all, the all, the all, the all. What is that? That is the unbelieving religious folks. That is the Jews. Who else is it? It's the lost and carnal world. That is the soldiers who literally did the act of piercing. And then also the believer who couldn't even be covered by the blood and water that came pouring out of the wound had they not been there, believed, trusted, and been engaged in the very scenario. They also which pierce him is the same as every eye that seeth him is the same as all kindred that shall wail. Everybody is going to see this. This is what I'm trying to prove here. This is not just some secret hidden thing where everybody is just caught up and disappears from the face of the earth. When Jesus Christ cometh in the clouds, every eye shall see him. There's nobody that is left, nobody exempt from seeing that is here upon this earth. 
Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 9 says, And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Here it's reaching from Zechariah into the future. I believe what is talked about is what's happening in Revelation. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced and shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Here is the great mourning that is coming upon him. Here is the wailing that is coming on upon the people that have witnessed this act. And here you'll find, as it often does in Zechariah, the timeline changes from the present experience of Zechariah to the time of Christ, to the vision of things which are to come. And what I see, though, is when it refers to as the pouring out of grace, wouldn't that be the very blood and water of Jesus Christ that poured out upon the people that would be willing to receive of that same sacrifice, the blood of Christ, offering atonement for their very souls. When it says that supplications were made, prophesied in Zechariah, I believe that's referring to the statement that he made just before that, and Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Jesus pleading in intercessory prayer that those that had done the great act, those that had pierced him, those that had sinned against the Father, sinned against the Son, sinned against the very Holy Spirit that was waiting in the wind, and they had supplications made for him as Christ called out upon them. But then we have those as pictures from the cross being the prevailing pouring out of grace and the supplications made, but then also the great mourning. Now we can't think and imagine to ourselves that there was a great mourning at the time of Christ. For all the religious cried out and said, crucify him, crucify him. The Romans on board just to silence and, and get peace returned to the area. We're just on board with doing it. Most were crying out in anger. A few were mourning. But you know what's going to be the opposite thing when it comes to the end days? Is that most are going to be crying out for fear and for torment and for wailing and for, for being broken and defeated by the living God as he returns. And there is going to be some rejoicing. The tables will turn and suddenly the believers that are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will be rejoicing as he comes to gather together. The tables will be turned. We will be the ones celebrating those that are alive and remain. And those that are turning against the Savior, those that had pierced Him, being all of us, those that had not believed on the grace being extended, poured out from His wound, and that received of the supplications that were promised, those will be crying out, those will be mourning, those will be weeping and wailing because of Him. And should we get all sad? No. They shall be weeping and wailing because of Him, even so, Amen. Amen. That's what we're going to be saying. Even so, amen. It's going to come to a point where things will be so wicked and heinous on this world that we'll be like, when, Lord? When, Lord? When, Lord? The saints in heaven will be crying, when, Lord? When, Lord? How long? How long? And suddenly, when things come to the end, when things are winding down, when we see these things come to pass, as we described a few weeks from Revel or Matthew chapter 24 and Revelation chapter 6, and it's winding down, we too will start and preach that great imminency doctrine. Jesus could come at any moment. There's going to be a small little space of time where that doctrine will be true and we will be waiting to be able to say, even so, amen. It's over. It's finished. Behold, every eye shall see him. They also which pierced him and all kindred shall well because of him. That's all, all, all who are alive and remain unto that day. That's what I believe. In verse 8, he continues and he says, I am Alpha and Omega. Again, Christ giving revelation of himself through the word, through the angel, to the servant who bears record of it, gives it to us that we can read, hear, keep, and be blessed thereby. He continues to just lift himself up saying, I am Alpha and Omega. You know what he's saying there? He's saying, I am A and Z. I am the beginning. I am the ending. And exactly what he says in the next phrase, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Jesus makes this great I am statement that encapsulates all. He is the end, the beginning. He is the Almighty. He is the universally Im Im immortal one. He just is beyond what we can even comprehend. That's why he is the beginning and the ending. Who is the beginning and the ending? You start driving somewhere and you begin and then you get to somewhere and you end. How can you be both at once? Well, God can. 
He can be both at once, the beginning and the ending, the Alpha and the Omega, the A and the Z. This is what he makes that great statement of himself. The Almighty, the All-Powerful, the All-Glorious One, the same one that's coming in clouds, the same one that's being revealed to us in this book doctrinally. Verse 9, John says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Here John gets personal. He says, I am your brother. I am your relative. We have the same father. And isn't it wonderful to see that John here in foresight recognized that he would be recording something that he could embrace somebody intimately thereby. He was penning the very words of God, but he knew that this was personal. He knew that he was reaching through the fabric of time in order to reveal something. First and foremost to the churches that God commanded him to reveal these truths unto, but secondly to even us as we stand here today. He knew these things would have to be set forth in such a way, and so he wanted to make it personal, as Paul does quite often when he's writing to certain individuals in churches. John here says, I am your brother. I am your companion. I am your family. I am your friend in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. Christ. And even in tribulation, he highlights, he is in tribulation with us, and he is rejoicing with us, and he's encouraging with us in all of these things. The Bible says, who shall separate us from the love of God? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And the first item is, shall tribulation? And the question is asked. The answer is no. We glory in tribulations because these tribulations work with patience. They bring us to a point where we can be more comfortable waiting, more comfortable waiting, patient to endure, patient to long suffer, patient to wait, patient to hope, patient to reach out and just, just embrace whatever comes upon us while we wait for something greater. And here John, he is that companion in the tribulation. He is that friend in the same tribulation. Here, he was in an isle that was called Patmos, very specifically. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and verse 6, It is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. So God here is promising a recompense to those that would trouble us. So when tribulation comes upon us, here is something that we can find peace in. Here is something that though we are in trouble and though we are in turmoil, we can find peace that God will recompense the trouble upon those that are troubling us. But also again, John here reaches out and he says, hey, I'm a companion of yours. Hey, I'm a brother of yours. Hey, I'm with you in this. And here I reveal unto you a few truths. Here I reveal unto you what God has given unto me. Here we see we're in good company then. He is, John, in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. Now, according to the world, in the context of what we're reading, we would just say, well, John is in Patmos. He's just, he's just there in Patmos, just like we're just here in North York, just like earlier I was just in Chicago. We were just there. Right? This is just a geographical place. But he's referring and he's extending it beyond that, saying, no, I'm not just in Patmos. I'm in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. I'm in the patience of Jesus Christ. I'm in the care of Jesus Christ. The Bible says the kingdom of God is within you, and therefore where he went, the kingdom was there. Where he was, God was being patient over him. He was the patient of Jesus Christ, the great physician now is here. Oh, hear the mighty Jesus. And also, in good company, we have him there for good reason. What was the reason why John was there? He said he was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So the whole reason why he was placed upon this desert island was because of the word of God, because of the testimony of Jesus Christ, which he had. And this was the reason why they put him in tribulation, in the trouble, which he turned around and made it positive to recognize, hey, I'm not in tribulation, I'm not in trouble. Though I'm here and though I'm comforting you and though I'm embracing you as a brother and as a companion in even this, don't you forget that you're in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. Though the world of God had sent you here. Though the testimony of Jesus Christ had put you here and you proclaiming that you are always in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ no matter where the world puts you. Whether they throw you on a desert island, whether they throw you into a fiery furnace. 
The reality is, is that you are with him. John is with you through what? The word of God. Through what he has recorded here. Through what he has revealed unto us of the Father, of Jesus, and of the revelation of Jesus Christ. John here in tribulation and the kingdom and patience of the saints was also, in verse 10, in the spirit. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. So here he is also in the spirit. So even when in trouble, he is in the spirit. Quite often us, when we get in trouble, we, that's when we suddenly don't want to be in the spirit. That's when we back away from spiritual things. That's when we start making excuses. Oh, I'm going through this. I'm going through that. I'm really busy with this. I'm really busy. I'm struggling. Things are hard. You need to be in the spirit on the Lord's day. You need to be spiritually minded on the Lord's day. You need to be full of the Holy Ghost on the Lord's day, even as he was. Be in church, be in church, be in church. When things are bad, be in church. In the Lord's Day, which we recognize universally as Sunday, a, a time that we've set aside as Sunday, the Lord's Day, we are to be in the Spirit. Well, how do we get in the Spirit? Songs, hymns, spiritual songs, fellowship one another, encouraging one another. The best place to be is in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, and the best place to be in the Spirit is with God's people. I think that's the call here, that John... He is here on the Lord's day. It's Sunday to him, perhaps, but it's the day that he has set aside regardless to be with the Lord. But he's also here at this time receiving a vision of the Lord's day, which is to come, which is the day of his judgment, of his wrath. And here he's in the spirit at the time. And what I grasp from this is that John, at the right time, was in the right place, and he heard from Christ. And we need to be mindful of these things. We need to be prepared to always be in the right place at the right time to hear the word of God. There seems to be kind of a, a, a set point, a, a manner that John had. You know that Paul quite often had the manner of going in on the Sabbath day and preaching in the synagogues. John, I believe, had the manner of taking the Lord's day and being in the spirit that day. He was prepared unto that need. He was prepared unto that time. He was prepared to be in that place in order to hear Christ speak. The right time, the right place, the Lord speaks unto him. As of a trumpet, as of a trumpet. In verse 11, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I don't get tired of hearing this. The first and the last. I think Christ is trying to explain something to us when he often repeats himself. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Pergamos, and unto Smyrna, I missed that one, unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. So the purpose here is that a book would be recorded and it would be sent specifically unto these seven churches. And the command to do so comes from a great voice, as it were a trumpet that comes up behind him, and he turns in verse 12 to see the voice that spoke to me. He turns to see the voice that spake to him, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. That's what we need to do. We need to turn to hear the voice that speaks unto us. We need to turn to hear the voice that speaks to us. Turn to hear the voice that speaks to us, right? Not physically, not, not hearing a voice behind us, but he heard the word of God, didn't he? He turned to hear, see the voice. He didn't imagine that he would see a visage. He, perhaps it was a familiar voice. Perhaps he knew the voice of the Lord. He turned to hear the voice that spake to him. We too can turn and hear the voice that speaks to us. If we've read it before, it's going to be a familiar voice. It's going to be the voice of the shepherd. It's going to be the voice testifying within us with the Spirit that we are the sons of God. We know him. He knows us. That same voice that John heard and recognized, that voice of a trumpet, we can hear by turning Amen. to the voice. Turning to the voice. Turning to the voice that speaks to us. It says, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And I like this. Go to verse 20. Just flip over. Seven golden candlesticks. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. And as I said at the beginning of the study last week, that signification simply means to convey a meaning, to give clarity, to give something that's easy to be understood. It's not a mishmash. It's not a darkening of the topic. It gives clarity. He sent it, signified it, that we can understand and have these things actually revealed to us. 
And so that's why it doesn't surprise me. And then I love how God gives us a quick example. We've just read that truth that he sent and signified it. And now he's going to give us something that seems a little obscure. Like, whoa, God, you're, you're talking in, in some language I don't understand. What are these seven golden candlesticks? And as God promises, he signified those things. He makes them plain by highlighting to us that those seven golden candlesticks are the very seven churches that he was sent to write to. Right before that, we see the Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, and so on. These are the very candlesticks. And when he turned, he saw the golden candlesticks. God conveyed unto him what those mean a little bit later, and he understood the vision, but all this was probably happening very quickly unto him. But when he turns, it says, in the midst, verse 13, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girded about the paps with a golden girdle. He turned and in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, the seven churches, he saw the Son of Man. He saw the King of Kings. He saw the Alpha and the Omega. He saw the Lord God Almighty, holy, holy, holy. The Bible records of him. He sees him in the midst of the candlestick. And those in the Bible record that where two or three are gathered in the midst, there am I. And here the churches are set in array. He sees the candlesticks and in the midst, he sees one like unto the Son of Man. Here's the statement. If the world is going to see Jesus today... It will be through the churches. It will be in the midst of the churches. If the world is going to see Christ today, before he comes in clouds, before he's in glory, before every eye shall see him, he has to be seen in the midst of the churches. Doesn't this make sense? The pillar and ground of the truth, the root and offspring, the thing that he died for, the thing that he, was, he, he, he shed his blood for is the purpose of living out the commission preaching out the commission, and that he could be seen in the midst of them. And that's the picture I like to grab hold of here. He turned. He saw seven candlesticks. In the midst was Christ. And if Christ is going to be seen today, it'll be through the churches. They will see first the fire. They will see first the candlestick. And they will see Christ within that because of the light of the candlestick shine. We're all just little lights. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Amen. It's good. It, it, it's, it's, it's a truth that you find in the scriptures where Christ needs to be seen in the midst. And this is exactly what John saw. He saw Christ standing in the midst of the seven churches he's about to write to. And here you find the appearance of him is something that's astonishing. Something he'd never seen before. He had known the Lord. He recognized the voice of the Lord, but here he's trying to grasp the whole visage of it all and understand, and so he describes just as he was asked to do. Write the things which thou saw, write the things that thou saw, what thou seest, write in a book. And here he begins. And in the midst of the candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. Like unto, because it wasn't in his understanding exactly what he remembered of Christ. Something, something different, but he recognized that it was him. Clothed with a garment down to the foot. And there's a difference. Woe to those that go in long clothing. But here Christ, though in the earth he only ever was in long clothing when being mocked by the Romans. Here he is in long clothing and rightfully so. He's been resurrected. He has been glorified. He is in his priestly attire. He is in his royal attire. He is in a garment down to the foot. He is in that proper garment, that robe that signifies who he is. A golden girdle then about his paps. People next to his heart. Because that's what you saw in the high priest. He had the tribes of Israel marked on his heart in 12 different stones that represented each one of them. That's what the high priest wore. I believe that same garment, that same girdle that was girt about his paps, had a similar impression, marking that his people are on his heart, that his people are being adorned upon his breastplate. Even as he took John and held him on his breast and gave him a hug and, and encouraged him in that fashion, even so, God holds his people close to him. He's royal. He's the high priest, the highest of priests, and yet he still keeps his people near his heart. What did we learn about earlier? In the shadow of his wings, right? Underneath his breast, that's where he keeps his people, close to his heart. Verse 14, his head, 
and his hairs were white like wool. Perhaps this is the thing that was different. Not very many people have white as wool hair by the time they're 33, which tradition tells us Christ was when he was crucified. So he sees that Christ's hair now is white as wool. His head, an entirety of it is made up of like a woolen visage. Here I think that signifies the wisdom that he has and has obtained. All wisdom was obviously always his, but now he is resurrected and glorified, and so it, the visage of it is seen upon his resurrected flesh, his resurrected body. Also, it signifies that he is the Ancient of Days that you hear the Bible refer to in the Old Testament quite often. The Ancient of Days, the, the glorious one of old, right? He's the beginning and the ending, right? Such longevity that he would grow white hairs, right? The hoary head being the highest of respect that we ought to give to people. Rise up before the holy head, the Bible says, before the hoary head. And so Jesus wears that visage, that white wool upon him. And white as snow, it says, crystal clear snow that we see in Canada even. That same bright, crisp, newly fallen snow is how his hair looked. And his eyes, I like this, were as a flame of fire. His eyes were as a flame of fire. And this flame of fire and this vision that he has from it, that burning, is going to be the same thing which tries and which judges. That's what you see coming from the eyeballs of Jesus Christ here, the fire that tries. If you go to 1 Corinthians in chapter 3, specifically to the Christian, we know that the wicked are condemned already. We know that those believed not are condemned already. And they're on their way to a devil's hell that was never meant for man to go in. But because they sinned and fell and did not believe on the salvation of Jesus Christ, they're condemned already. But what would his eyes, like as flame of fire, be used for? Piercing, seeing all. What are they doing? 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 10. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a master builder, I have laid the foundation and another build thereupon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he had built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved so as by fire. Here he's describing the, the, the judgment of Christ that's going to come upon the believers. Everyone else is condemned already. They'll stand before the great white throne and they'll be cast forever alive into the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. But for us, the first time we see Christ as John for the first time sees one like unto the Son of Man. And that's probably going to be the same statement that I have. He's like unto the Son of Man. Of course I see the glory. Of course I feel the intense heat and pressure that comes upon me by standing in front of the living God. The only reason I can stand there is because I too have been glorified and resurrected. And I'm right before him by his precious blood. But when we stand before him, we'll see one like unto the Son of God, and his eyes as a flame of fire will be pointed right at us. And what are those eyes as fire? They're going to try the works that every man hath of what sort it is. Wood, hay, and stubble will be burned up and cast out for the drop, and everything that is gold, silver, or precious stone will abide the fire and will live on, and we will be rewarded for the same. That is the eyes of fire that we see in our Lord and Savior at this time. Verse 15, And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burn with the furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Perhaps the walk and the talk, just being referred to here. He's walking, he's, he's making an impact. It's, it, it's strong, there's, there's strength in the brass as it hits the ground, but his walk and his talk are in the same context. Christ, the only one that could walk the law, is the only one that could talk the law, is the only one that could righteously with his eyes judge men, even believers. In verse 16, you see, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. So here are the seven stars. We know also from verse 20 that the seven stars are the angels of the church of God, are the messengers of the church of God, are the preachers, I believe, of the church is of God that are here, the pastors of the churches of God. He has them then kept in his right hand, and here out of his mouth goes a sharp two-edged sword. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, For the word of God is quick 
and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Again, the word of God coming with that conv convincing and piercing slice removes joints and marrow, removes sword and spirit, divides them apart, discerns the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. His very eyes then, the words he is speaking, are what will judge us in the last day, what will reveal our works, yet so as by fire for those that have none of them, though they are saved, but the reward that will come will be because we have kept the word, his eyes judge righteously, and him with whom we have to do will say either, well done, thou good and faithful servant, or he will say, sit here under my footstool. Hey, but you're in heaven, you're saved, yet so as by fire. Glory to God for even that position here. But here the pastors are in the Lord's hand. The word is in the mouth of the Lord, and we see that the appearance, his countenance, was as the sun shineth in his strength. A little bit of a picture here again of Christ being in the midst of the church. Now the word proceeding from his mouth to the pastors that are in his hand who are giving it unto the churches that they are overseeing. And what we see here, because his visage is as the sun which shineth in his strength, we are seeing that Jesus is that ultimate brightness. That's his visage. That's his appearance that no man can approach unto. The Bible says of the Father. Now glory be to God that his express image Image is contained within the Son, so we'll be able to see and interact with Christ. But the Father is of this light that no man can proceed unto. And so the word going from him is only transmitted by the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So it proceeds out of his mouth, the word is given to the right hand that he has fellowship, where he holds his very preachers, and they distribute it. If I was to drive it, there would be there would be Jesus. There would be the Lord in this very bright and intense light, so bright that you couldn't even look at it. And then there would be the dimmer, and you'd be able to see the pastor. And then there would be perhaps another light shade over it. It'd be a little dimmer, and that would be the churches. And then the world would see this, this, this minute light as it kind of gets passed down for it. Remember when Moses stood before the Lord, his appearance was so bright as it had come upon him from transmission by the Lord, that they couldn't even look at him. They couldn't even behold him. They didn't want to steadfastly look upon him. They turned away from what was before him. So he had to put a veil over his face. In the same way, I believe that this picture is talking about the transmission of the word of God. The full glory is in Christ. It's transmitted by the word of God into the preachers who get a portion of the glory. And I don't think they could even behold the whole thing without exploding or turning for fear, right? Being, being overcome by it. They then transmit it to the church and that, that glory then, it's a little bit distributed, a little bit dimmer and as it's revealed to the world. But hey, a grain of mustard seed of the word of God is all that is needed when you put your faith in it to bring somebody to the point of salvation. And they can begin to grow and to have more things revealed unto him. We don't wake up and, and day one of being saved just understand everything of the scriptures. I think that our heads would explode. And so the picture here that you're seeing is that the world needs to get the word from the church. And what's the church's responsibility? Go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Very milk of the word things that everybody is charged to do and everybody is enabled and able to do. Give milk unto the world. Give minute truths to the world. Give, yes, the most glorious truth that you can be saved by believing in faith in him. But these are not deep things of the things of God. But then the church is received from the preachers and from the pastors something that's a little bit more a little bit more dense, a little, a little bit brighter, a little bit, a little bit stronger of meat, right? That we come here to hear from the preacher some, some stronger meat of the word, right? It's, it's not as diluted. But the preacher then gets it straight from the word of God, right? Which is Christ in his glory, proceeding that out of his mouth as the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, which is, is beyond anything that we could even understand. I mean, this isn't, this isn't Christ in all his glory that's just going to destroy us and bring us to nothing before him. But this, but this is a dilution that is, that is pretty pure. I believe that the King James Bible is completely pure. I believe that it has everything that I need to know. The way that I mean when I say that, it's, it's not, it, it's, uh, 
It's completely potent, but I am never going to get everything from it, if that's, what, if that's what I mean. This is completely sufficient, but my brain will never absorb all the glory that's to behold within this. And so then you see Christ, in his infinite brightness, preaches the truth through the Bible. The pastors then give it unto the churches. The churches take it to the world. Hey, and we all have the ability to go and to behold him straight face in the same way as even the preachers do. This isn't some special ministry that I have here where only I can behold the great truths about it. We all have the ability and we are all able and we are enabled to get the same truths as anyone can from it. I'm simply just describing what I see in the scriptures as to how it goes and is transmitted through the visage that we see here. Jesus, to the Word of God, to the pastors and preachers, to the churches, to the world, is how the Word of God is supposed to go forward. So John here, he knew Jesus. He, he embraced him while he was with him. He was the beloved one that leaned upon Jesus' breast. You know, they, they hugged one each other, gave, gave each other, you know, manly hugs and pats on the back. He embraced him. He, he rested his head in his bosom, you know. He had that personal relationship with him in the flesh, I believe, both the original carnal flesh that he had, and also the glorified flesh, if you were to distinguish them by that. Jesus' is, Jesus is flesh while he is upon earth, both the glorified resurrected version of it. John embraced both of them. And yet in verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And this is why I mean the brightness of his glory when we stand before it. Even if you're a preacher and you're hearing the word of God, you're getting lots of glorious things. You're pulling from the scriptures. You're full of the spirit. You're seeing his glory. But if we were to ever see him in the visage and truth that John saw, we would do the exact same thing. Fall at his feet is dead. Just, just thought. No, nothing left in us. No strength left in us. So many saints of old have fallen to that same thing where they have crumbled before the visage and sight of Almighty God and needed to literally be lifted up by an angel in order to stand on his feet. And he laid his right hand upon me and said unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Just reminds him again, hey, I'm the first and last. He's like, I know. You just you just knocked me on my on my tail. You just knocked me on my face. You just you just took the wind out of me. And he says, Come on, get up, fear not, I'm he. Right? He's just he's affirming to him who he is, and he's affirming to him that he's able to provide, that he does not need to fear. Verse 18, he's going to continue on. He's going to accentuate the same things that we've heard over and over and over. Remember, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So if he's going to be revealed to us, we've got to expect that there's going to be perhaps a little bit of repetition of the things that he really wants us to know about him. And one of the most important things he wants us to know about him is in verse 18. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. He liveth. And was dead. He liveth and was dead. The glorious resurrection expressed here. What a great truth of him is that he liveth, but he was dead. And behold, he is alive forevermore. What is he saying here? He liveth. He is. He was dead. He was. He is alive forevermore. He is to come. He liveth, was dead, is alive forevermore. He is, he was, and he is to come. And because of these things, because of Jesus Christ coming to this world, extending grace, behold, he cometh with clouds, every eye shall see him, they also have pierced him. The blood of Christ being poured out upon people in a gracious and merciful act as he descended into hell, as the Bible says, he was dead, and behold, he's alive forevermore. He resurrected here, and to the end, that those that have seen and believe can receive. Verse 19 says, Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. And this is what you're going to find as he continues to go through the book of Revelation. This is what Christ's purpose is to it all. He says, Hey, I am he that liveth, was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. I am he which is, and which was, and which is to come. I am the Alpha and the Omega, and I want to reveal myself to you. And in order for me to reveal myself to you, you need to write these things things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. And I believe if you were to break down the scriptures that we're going to read, in verse 1, or chapter 1, you're going to find the things which are seen. Chapter 2 and, and chapter 3, you're going to find the things which are, as he begins to give the message to the churches. There's some transitioning happening in chapter 4 and verse 5, but the things which shall be hereafter start at chapter 4 and continue on through to the end. The things that are going to be prophesied about Christ that are specifically revelation of him, revealing him. Amos chapter 3, and I believe this, verse 20 says the mystery of the seven stars. We also read that. The mystery. And anytime if you were to look up that word, the mystery, the mystery, the mystery, 
it's like, oh, this is confusing. This must be veiled. This must be something unknown. This must be something concealed. Try to look up mystery in your King James Bible. And everywhere you find mystery within the context, the mystery will be explained. Because our God, you can go to Genesis chapter 19, 18, I'll finish there. Genesis chapter 18. Our God is not one that desires to be in secret. He desires to be known. He desires to know. The whole reason why Christ came to this earth is to redeem sinners. The whole purpose of us was that he would walk with us in the garden. He wants to know and be known. He wants to have us understand him, and he wants to, us to have a relationship with him. And so if he's going to present a mystery, he's going to make sure that he tells us what that mystery is. That mystery shall be known. You'll see in Genesis 18. Amos chapter 3 and verse 7 says, Surely the Lord will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. And so I believe that things that God wants us to know, if he is going to do a thing, he won't do it unless he reveals it unto his servant, the prophets. This is why, as he wants us to know him, he wants to know us and he wants that relationship. This is why the Bible says we shall not be overtaken as a thief is because God has revealed all things unto us. He has given his revelation unto the prophets. I believe we have everything of knowledge and understanding that we need contained within the scriptures. Surely he'll do nothing but he has revealed it unto his servants the prophets. We're not going to be scratching our heads. We're not going to be overtaken as a thief. We're not going to be in darkness as the Bible says. Though some people will say that that's what the rapture is going to be is it's going to be a thief pulling away people without them unawares. We already, we already debunked that. We already tore that apart and, and kicked it to the curb. But God here explains in that book of Amos that he will do nothing except he reveals it unto his servants, the prophets, even as Abraham, great man of faith, a friend of God, the Bible says, Genesis 18 and verse 16, it says, and the men rose up from thence and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham surely shall surely become a great mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed for him. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord and do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. So here, God has this revelation amongst his angels. He says, he says, should I withhold from Abraham that thing which I do? Amos says, surely the Lord will do nothing, but he revealeth his secrets unto his servants and prophets. Even so, we saw the mysteries that were in the revelation expounded to us that we could understand what he's talking about. Yeah, there's a, a few extra applications we can pull out of it and things, but the plainness of the scriptures just gives us a plain revelation of what Jesus is doing. What's the story? He comes to John. He sends an angel. He tells him a revelation to do. He tells him of himself. I am, I am, I am. First, last, beginning, ending. Expounds unto him to the end that he would give the truths that he once recorded to churches that would send it forth. And it's all to a purposeful end that the things which are and shall be and shall be hereafter, the revelation of him would come to an end. I mean, the very story of it's pretty, pretty simple, right? And this is what God promises. Red, yellow, black, and white, young and old. If you're a believer of Christ, you have the Holy Spirit in you. You have access to these things. You can grab the scriptures and embrace them and pull them in and learn things from them. You can know the mysteries, the deep things of God, the hidden things of God. You can behold his very face as he preaches the sword of the Lord to you. Surely the Lord will do nothing, but he reveals his secret unto his servants, the prophets. And here are his prophets. Embrace them, pull them in. And as he revealed unto Abraham, nay, I will not hide these things. Abraham, I know him. He will command his children and his household after him. He will keep the way. He will do justice and judgment. And he does it by faith. This isn't works. Remember, nothing was of works. But he understood that Abraham was a man of faith. And so he knew Abraham. He knew his heart. He knew his spirit. And God today wants to know you in the same way that he could reveal these same things unto you as he revealed unto his servants and prophets. And how do we do it? How do we get a hold of it? We turn. See the voice that spake. We turn. See the voice that spake. We turn and we see the voice that spake. 
Blessed are they that read, those that hear, those that keep the things that are written here. Turn and hear the voice. 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 We have access to these same things. He wants to reveal himself to you. He wants to bless you. And I pray that he continues to do so. I'm loving this book so far. This is great. Look into these things and see if they're so. Heavenly Father, I thank you.